Today is Tuesday, July 30th. Damien, what's on your mind? I've got notes for you this time. I'll tell you what's on my mind. Notes? Notes on my mind is the first, uh, the story, a continuation of the story from our first video on the DHS stop in Alabama, right? There's a good update on that, a positive update. And I'm thinking about that in uh, alongside a conversation we had with uh, somebody from CFI, the South uh, East Immigration Freedom Initiative, which is an initiative of the Southern Poverty Law Center that was canned in, uh, in mid-June, that was completely shut down by the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about this idea of community lawyering, and that has something to do with the Sifi story. And then finally, I'm thinking about Umberto Eco and like about the Japanese Edo period. Umberto Eco because I'm thinking about fascism, Japanese Edo period because I'm reading this book called I Am a Cat. That was snobby. You're a snob. Uh, no, I'm not. That's a lot, but it's kind of it's kind of fun. I'm letting it jumble. And then the the other thing that's happening is that uh, I'm thinking about H2B visas because I'm in the middle of getting these things approved and then thinking about future seasons, and et cetera, et cetera. What I wanna talk about first today, and this is really important because I think it sets up um, the remainder of my thoughts. So this DHS story where you can see the video here. Uh, and if you're listening at home, I just point it up and uh, there's a link to, to, to the first story. So in any given day, episode one, I tell the story, a true story, something that happened, you know, at the time that that was filmed of a client who had been stopped on his way through Alabama by a local police force just north of Mobile. That police force, uh, essentially the, the police officers in that situation ended up racially profiling him. He's of Mexican descent, but he's born in the US. And uh, his he was with his family, that's important. He was with his wife and two-year-old son and his father-in-law. And he had done nothing wrong. He was on the way back from a car show. He had cash on him, $25,000. The police officers finding nothing, called Department of Homeland Security anyway. Department of Homeland Security ends up confiscating the cash, two phones, two laptops, um, and I think a phone from his father-in-law. And he's just kind of sent away. And there's all sorts of horrific details, like Department of Homeland Security tried to give him a receipt that didn't list the amount of cash on it. But what's important here is that, number one, my client was a former state trooper. Number two, he's a successful businessman. Number three, he's just a good person. And number four, he was just horrifically racially profiled. And then his money was extrajudicially stolen, essentially. No, not, not essentially stolen, in fact, by the Department of Homeland Security. And we struggled for weeks. Uh, I was calling around uh, every lawyer I knew that could kind of get to a good law firm in Alabama. Um, some of the top private firms didn't want to take it uh, for reasons. You know, I don't know if they, they thought the person could pay. I don't know if they profiled him. I don't know. The short answer to this long story is that we did get the Institute of Justice, which is a large civil rights organization to actually take it. And they want to make it a core part of their case. They believe in it and the client has decided to take this all the way, right, against both DHS and that local police department. What this has had me thinking about is that this client, and I mentioned this in the previous podcast, had the money to call me. I'm already his lawyer, right, on, on H-2B visas. He had the money for me to employ other lawyers, right, to, to look around and find the best representation that could be found for him. And he has the money, the time, the ability, the education um, and had the right background, right, as a state trooper and a business owner to get a large civil rights organization to back him in this fight. 99.5% of the people that are stopped in that same area don't. And so it leads you to think what led these officers in both the Department of Homeland Security and that small police department to think that they could get away with this? What is this a force? The force, you know, this is where I start thinking about Umberto Eco, to me smells like um, a foundational sort of underlying fascism that, that, that lives in American society. Tell me why. Now fascism is one of those words that can mean a lot of things and Umberto Eco, who was an Italian professor and philosopher and novelist and all around just genius that died, that, that's died at this point. He was born right in the 1930s. He lived through uh, the, uh, the end of the Mussolini fascist period, r r lived through World War II. And he wrote this uh, article in New York Magazine 1995 where he called something or fascism. And he says, look, we call people fascist pigs. 
we say that so-and-so is fascist, we say the Nazis are fascist, we said that Mussolini was fascist, we said the British have their own fascist system, we said there's American fascism. But when we look at it, it's really hard to uh, come up with a set of rules because fascism itself is structurally incoherent. So it's structurally contradictory. It has ideas that are designed to be contradictory on purpose within a system, yet we somehow, we still recognize fascism wherever we see it. So there has to be some sort of underlying quality that leads to this feeling. He gives this kind of example. He says, okay, imagine five objects, okay? Or imagine five ideas. Idea one, has elements A, B, and C. And let's say that that idea is Mussolini's fascism. The first time that, you know, fa fascism comes from Mussolini, right? He invented fascism. It comes from an Italian word. So Italian fascism is A, B, C. That's idea one. Idea two, let's just call it B, C, D. So no A, just B, C, D. Idea three is C, D, E. Idea four is D, E, F. Idea five is uh, E, F, G. So if idea one, A, B, C, is Italian fascism, when we put it next to idea two, B, C, D, let's call that Nazism, okay? Let's call that the Nazis. We can tell they're not the same, right? One has a D feature, one has an A feature, but they both share B and C. They're close enough where we say, okay, those two things look like that's, that's fascism. And so let's say uh, Italian fascism was tied by the end of Mussolini's reign, by the end of his regime, was, was closely tied to the church. Whereas Nazis themselves um, had an explicitly anti-church ideology and had this new neo-paganism that they dealt with. Uh, belief in old uh, Celtic mythology, for example, belief in the occult, etc. But still, we look at Mussolini and we look at the Nazi party and we say that's fascism. They're not the same, but they're both fascism. Then you go over here and you go, okay, let's look at Franco's Spain, okay? Not the same thing as, as Italy. There's a lot of very explicit uh, oppression of, of communists in Franco Spain the same way that there wasn't in Italy, even though Italy repressed them. Okay, but I still see, I still see kind of black shirts and I still see the aesthetic. Okay, those two things are the same and it's, but it's very similar to the Nazis and in, in terms of how many people were killed. And where it gets really interesting though is when you have ABC and, and EFG. So even though Franco's uh, Nazism here might have very little to do, which is ABC with EFG, EFG has a lot to do with DEF, you know? And DEF is really close to BCD. So there's this spectrum of fascism across time that despite fascism A, original fascism, not being the same as you know, a uh, uh, fascism over here, we can still feel and see the difference. And there's some sort of underlying common thread. Some of those common threads, Umberto Eco goes on to point out, include uh, an appeal to tradition, an appeal to this idea that all relevant knowledge that gives us the truth of the universe has already been had. We just, we just have to put all the pieces of this knowledge together. There's this idea that, uh, uh, there, there are heroes in society, and in fact, it's not just a hero, it's everyone who participated in the fascist movement is a hero themselves. There's often machismo, there's often a, a predilection towards guns or carrying weapons because heroes need weapons, and there's an internal struggle to win. And everyone that's not against you, uh, that's not for you, is against you. Right? There's this eternal struggle, and at the end of it, there's a promise of eternal peace, a golden age, but the struggle can never itself uh, be completed so no fascist leader has ever actually gotten to the golden age. If you notice, nobody's like, God, uh, Nazi Germany, what a wonderful place that was in 1946. Or, oh boy, you know what's great about Mussolini, that period in uh, 1952 when everybody in Italy was doing great. Or, uh, oh boy, that David Duke, I'm really glad that uh, Louisiana is such a utopia. <laughs> like, it doesn't exist. And so what you're stuck with, in fact, is perpetual struggle, but you do it always because there's a golden age waiting on the other end. That's really interesting. I think we definitely feel that in the US, but there's this other element that's really important, which is because everything's an eternal struggle, because we know that there's a golden age, because we, we know that all truth has already been created. We don't need new truth and we don't need to think. And once you decide that you don't need new truth, that all knowledge is already there, maybe it's in a book, maybe it's in several books, maybe it's some sort of occult passage, maybe it's a mixture of all these things. Again, it doesn't have to make sense. You are primed as a participant in that fascism to give over your control to somebody. Because 
it's no longer required that, let's say there's 10,000 people in a movement, right, fascist movement, uh, it's no longer required for 10,000 people to have a voice. It's only required for somebody to give an expression to all those voices because we're all thinking the same thing. All truth is decided. We know we're fighting and we know that the golden dawn is coming. Nothing else matters. And by the way, it's us against them. So you get this dictator, this totalitarian, who says, hey, I'm your voice. Here's the problem with that. That authoritarian has to believe that because he is now the only one talking, that the people, right, that are part of the fascist movement aren't as good as he is. And in fact, he starts to think that they're weak and he pushes them down. Right? He has contempt for them. And everybody that works for him, he has contempt for them too. That energy gets passed down to the next person in the hierarchy who has contempt below for those people below him or herself. When you're fully empowered, when you're the only voice and you have contempt and you have total power, there's no rules. And you show that there's no rules. And the top guy tells that to the lower guys, tells the guys to the guys below. And so I come back to Alabama. If we hadn't have spent the past eight years in this country, showing that there are no rules for those at the very top, at the tippity top, who are imbued with the power of, let's say, the presidency. We probably would be more surprised at what happened in Alabama to my client by these police officers. But as it stands, I had an immediate reaction when I got that call at 9.30 at night. I said, you've been racially profiled, and this is a police force that's been corrupted, and that knew that because of their local power, and because of who you were, even I'm not saying it's true, because who you were, and to them you were a brown Mexican man, they knew they could steal your money and there would be no repercussions because they saw themselves as a people imbued with power. They saw you as the other, who was perhaps even an enemy. And they saw that the people above them had no repercussions for the crimes they were carrying out. That's everyday fascism. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned a golden era. Mm. Can anyone ever achieve? Is that golden era ever achieved? Yeah, or is it, it just a perpetual myth of Sisyphus pushing the rock up? Did the South rise again yet? Not yet, no, but rumor has it. Rumor has it, yeah. right? It's always coming. Uh, is the day of judgment here? I hope not. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, are we all going to heaven? No yeah. comment. Did the Third Reich, is the Third Reich like still around? Right? Is the Yellow Emperor coming back? Has the Communist Party created an era of peace and prosperity in China? No. The DHS update is heartening in that this person, who happens to be in the 0.5% of people with resources, particularly as a man of Mexican descent in the U.S. South, is probably going to get justice at the end of the day and it's going to it's going to there's probably going to be consequences the bad news is 99.5 percent of people who this happened to won't that in the context of um an empowered brutal police authority to me smells an awful lot like something close to the a b c d e f divisions in umberto echo's concept of how fascism feels like you can feel it out. And so the reason that sci-fi is on my mind, because I said at the beginning, there's four things on my mind. There's my client, there's my DHS client, there's Umberto Eco's kind of concept of fascism, there's sci-fi and there's community lawyering. lawyering. The collapse of sci-fi is important. They're called CV, Southeast Freedom, Southeast Freedom um, uh, Immigration Initiative, South Southern Immigrant Freedom Initiative. Southern Immigrant Freedom Initiative, CFI. The reason that's important is even though it was 16 lawyers and staff that, that were let go, they were one of the only organizations on the ground that were doing direct representation of migrants in detained settings. So settings where we put thousands of people, 35,000 people about as of this recording, as, as high as 58,000 under the Trump administration. We put them in these isolated maximum security prison buildings where they're civil detainees, so they haven't committed any crimes. And we just forget about what happens to them. It's, it's sort of like the US hinterland. Fascism there is, is very real, right? Those people have no rights. They, they have um, very little freedom to find representation because they're not guaranteed it, um, unlike criminal uh, applicant, criminal, unlike um, folks under criminal arrest. In general, we treat them like numbers and they're completely dehumanized. So CFI being disbanded means that there's not another organization of their size that's doing direct representation. There is a private bar, but the private bar there has always been limited. And one of the things that came out in that story is that part of the 
answer as to why Sifi might have collapsed, part of it had to do with this like, new idea that became really fashionable around 2020 of community lawyering, which was in my view, which is in my view, in the immigration detained context, a misapplication of an otherwise worthy pr principle. So community lawyering comes from the set of ideas that began in 1930s uh, and 1940s, and then was really brought to the fore by the Shriver Center. This idea is that a lawyer doesn't always have to be somebody that's standing in front of the clients he or she represents, that's going to negotiate deals, that's going to sue somebody, that is a champion. In fact, in many situations, in 2020 it became in all situations, and that's where I have my kind of um, qualm. In many situations, a lawyer should be someone that helps educate a community, provides them the skills they need for community members themselves to become active participants in their own justice. And I get that and I believe in that in some situations. But one of the problems at CFI might have been that um, there was a contingent of younger lawyers in the kind of ideological fervor um, that followed the George Floyd killing that said, you know, we as uh, direct representatives need to be community lawyers instead. And that made to me makes very little sense in a detained context and within a fascist, uh, within a society where fascism might be a key danger. Because what you're in effect saying is, we are going to empower detainees in an isolated prison complex uh, in a very antagonistic state, whether it's Alabama or rural Georgia or Louisiana, to become their own advocates within an immigration system they can barely understand. Like it makes, it, it just, on its face, it makes no sense to me. And what it does is it really kind of cops out of the primary responsibility a lawyer is hired for, a lawyer exists for, which is to be the informed expert fighter in a system that doesn't work as advertised on paper, so cannot be taught. You're out of order! You're out of order! The whole trial is out of order! So you can, you can hardly teach somebody to, to navigate through it without them being in the system for a long time. By saying you're gonna community lawyer those people, what do you do? You, you, give them, you give them book knowledge so that they can do it themselves? When they themselves are already captured by the system? It makes no sense, and I think it goes against everything I understand is necessary to actually battle the injustices within a society where, where fascism tendencies and entrenched fascist-like power exist. You have to be able to, as a lawyer, take on the responsibility that you understand where the levers of justice and power lie, and you are gonna use your time your efforts, your training, your good health, to bring those powers to bear down on parties who take away rights and who wish to hide themselves from uh, the lens of justice um, in the furtherance of casting injustice on American citizens and residents, you're gonna bring the lens of justice back to that situation and you're gonna fight with your expertise. To say that you can do that as a community lawyer for people that are completely unequipped to do that to me sounds insane. Why am I saying this? I'm just saying this because it's on my mind. I'm not sure there's like a complete point to this, but I, except to say this, that DHS, the client who got mauled by the DHS and that local Alabama police office is going to get justice and he's going to get justice through direct lawyering, right? Through direct representation. And that sort of direct representation, the, um, the ability to hire people and the, and the fact that people exist who know how the American ideal American system is supposed to work, how justice is supposed to work, that very fact is what's going to keep the proliferation of this particular small pocket of fascist ideas and practices at bay. It might protect, potentially even eliminate them. On my mind is this idea that I got into lawyering in the first place because I believe that these little efforts matter. I believe it matters that CFI existed and that there were lawyers out there who were taking one case at a time within almost impossible, under almost impossible circumstances where it was hard to win cases. I think it matters, you know, to keep beating a rock with a spoon or keep dipping, you know, a teaspoon into the ocean and taking it out one, one bite at a time because there is no other way to battle the bad, dangerous, and authoritarian ideas that we live within. That's on my mind. And uh, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna just take that piss and vinegar and you know, continue with my job this week 
Um, I don't know if it all made sense to you. Um, the point of this podcast is not for me to make perfect sense. I think it wouldn't be fun that way, but this is really what I think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, it really shapes my identity as a lawyer and an advocate. So I hope you get something out of it and feel free to correct me in the comments. Feel free to add context, feel free to add debate. Do not be hateful. Uh, but but otherwise, you know, feel free. I invite it. And uh, that's this is who I am. It's on my mind. Have a great day.